Hello everyone. My name is Dustin Schwab and I'm a career development specialist here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, which we refer to as OOD. Today I am co-hosting with my colleague Julie Wood and we'd like to welcome you to the Employers Reasonable Accommodation Handbook six-part webinar series for the fourth session titled Neurodiversity at Work. Julie, will you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Dustin, and hello, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today. My name is Julie Wood, and I am OOD's Worksite Accessibility Specialist. I am also an occupational therapist and a certified ADA coordinator. My role includes providing education for employers that's focused on creating inclusive and accessible workplaces. So this includes discussing the guidelines under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, it includes identifying ideas to consider for reasonable accommodations and certainly sharing best practices and guidance for making the workplace accessible. Thank you, Julie. We'd like to take a moment to recognize that October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM. This year's theme, Disability, Part of the Equity Equation, celebrates the essential role people with disabilities play in the workplace and honors the significant diversity within the disability community. Throughout this webinar series, we have been highlighting best practices for creating disability inclusive workplaces and providing reasonable accommodations across all disability types. So far in this series, we have discussed intellectual, physical, and mental health disabilities. Those webinars are archived on our website at the link posted in the Q&A section. Today, our focus is on neurodiversity in the workplace, and next month we will discuss sensory disabilities, which will include blind, low vision, deaf, and hard of hearing disabilities. So before we begin, I'd like to mention that today's training comes with a learner's guide and a helpful fact sheet. It can be accessed now through the link that is posted in the Q&A section here in Microsoft Teams. And just as a reminder, the information that we share in these resources and during today's conversation is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice. But we do hope this information is helpful for you. We'll be stopping about halfway through today's presentation and then again before we conclude to answer questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A section at any time throughout the presentation so they're ready for us when we stop. Julie, would you like to address the accessibility practices we have included in today's webinar? Sure, we think about accessibility from the very beginning. For example, we use the accessibility checker that is built into Microsoft 365 to review the learner's guide, fact sheet, and PowerPoint. We pay attention to color contrast, font style and size, and we add alternative text to visual images. Also, in our delivery, you will notice that Dustin and I mention each other by name as the conversation between us goes back and forth. We do this on purpose to indicate who is speaking. This can be helpful when attendees are receiving this information through services like American Sign Language Interpretation and live captioning. After the webinar, we edit the transcript and fix any captioning errors before archiving the webinar in our on-demand library. Taking these steps up front can make this presentation more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Julie, I'm looking forward to our conversation today on neurodiversity in the workplace. Do you want to go over the topics that we will discuss today? Yes, we will provide an overview of neurodiversity and neurodivergence. We will share ways to create a disability inclusive workplace culture by sharing some disability etiquette and awareness tips. And then we will talk about the interactive process and what is unique about providing reasonable accommodations related to neurodivergence. And we will include examples, of course. To support this information, we will mention a variety of conditions throughout the webinar. Some of these may be repeated as examples to educate and inform employers of the best practices for fostering inclusive workplaces and providing reasonable accommodations. Now, Julie, as we were developing the name for this webinar, we had discussions about the terminology to use. We discussed two possible terms, neurodiversity and neurodivergence. Are these two words for the same concept? Is there a difference between the two? And where does neurotypical fit in? Dustin, to create our webinars, I review information from a variety of resources, and so I'll share how they define these terms. 
Neurodiversity is the term used to acknowledge the natural variation that exists in the human brain and recognizes that no two individuals are the same. This variation is referring to how we think, process information, learn, interact, behave, and perceive the world. Neurodivergence is the term that refers to the variation in the human brain that is outside what is recognized as the norm for brain function. The term neurotypical is used to refer to the variation in the human brain that falls within the norm. Because so many environments are created for the variation in the brain that falls within the norm, we will be approaching this topic from the perspective of neurodivergence and addressing ways to provide accommodations in the workplace to enable individuals with neurodivergence to perform work activities just as effectively in another way. Thank you, Julie. So throughout the employer's reasonable accommodation handbook, we have been sharing success stories of former OOD participants. Today, our first story is about Chris. It was published in the OOD Works newsletter on April 29th, 2022. Chris has autism spectrum disorder. He attended and graduated from Bowling Green State University with a bachelor's degree. There, he majored in actuarial science and minored in business. He was hired for an internship with Kroger through their neurodiversity initiative. Dustin, Chris was successful in the internship and eventually hired by Kroger in the research and development department. In this position, he uses his actuarial and business background to provide data for decisions that Kroger makes. Julie, Chris said, the people I work with are very nice, supportive, and willing to provide you with the help you need so you can succeed. Autism is one of the conditions included in the category of neurodivergence. What other conditions are included and how common are neurodivergent conditions? Justin, according to the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, which is known as EARN, 15 to 20 percent of the population in the United States is neurodivergent. This is a large category of conditions that can include a wide variance of abilities and limitations when it comes to brain functions. And you're right, autism is included in this category. What might not be as well known are the other conditions that are also included. Conditions like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, learning disabilities like dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia, mental health conditions like bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, and schizophrenia, and conditions like dyspraxia, epilepsy, intellectual disabilities, sensory processing disorders, and Tourette syndrome. We mentioned that Chris participated in an internship specifically designed for neurodiverse candidates. Internships like these recognize some of the common variances in abilities and limitations and ways to provide accommodations. Julie, can you explain some of the limitations that might be common for candidates who are neurodivergent? Yes, so everyone has their own natural variants, but some common limitations that can be a part of neurodivergent conditions include difficulty with social interaction, communication, speech, and language, limitations with functions like learning, reading, memory, self-control, and being flexible in thinking, sensitivity or insensitivity to sensory input, so things like light, sound, temperature, and crowds, difficulty with motor coordination. At times, physical behaviors may be present like rocking, expression of tics, and blurting, and limitations with adapting to changes or transitions. It's important to remember that along with our natural variation in brain function, we also all have our own unique abilities, strengths, and limitations. Someone with a neurodivergent condition may experience some of the limitations I listed, but rarely would experience them all. So it's always important to remember that each individual is unique. Julie, earlier you mentioned that neurodiversity is variation in things like how individuals think, process information, and interact. I think for many employers, one goal of a neurodiversity initiative is to cultivate that diversity to develop new practices for their organizations. Can you share some of the benefits employers might experience when developing a workplace that is inclusive of neurodiverse candidates? 
Justin, I think this is such an important point to emphasize. There are benefits to the fact that no two brains function exactly the same. Variance is beneficial. What some employers have recognized is this variance in how individuals learn, perceive the environment, and process information is leading to improved creativity, innovative thinking, and problem solving in the workplace. Like we mentioned, so often environments are created for the norm. But when we take a step back and think about expanding the environment to include this variance described by neurodiversity, what we are really doing is creating environments where all individuals have the flexibility to perform work in the way their brain is designed to do most effectively. So it makes sense to me that employers who make these efforts are noticing benefits in the workplace. Thank you, Julie. Okay, let's get into another story. This one is about Andrew and was published in the OOD Works newsletter on April 30th, 2021. Andrew has distal trisomy 15 and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. He graduated from high school and Pioneer Career and Technology Center in May 2020. Then he began looking for a job. He specifically looked for positions that he felt would keep his focus while he worked and played to his strengths. Eventually, he was hired by Burger King to wash dishes and keep the restaurant clean. Justin, Andrew said, when I was offered the job at Burger King, I was excited. He felt as though he fit in on the team from the start. Justin, they even celebrated his birthday on his second day of work. He said, the team at Burger King treats me so nice and I get along with them. Julie, Andrew's story reminds me that my birthday is coming up and I like cake, but I also think it's a good transition for discussing disability inclusive workplaces. A disability inclusive workplace is one like Andrew experienced at Burger King where employees with disabilities feel included in the workplace culture. Let's talk about some strategies that employers can utilize to foster this culture. Sure, Dustin. So a few quick examples of ways employers can influence this type of culture from the perspective of all disability types is to establish a process for providing reasonable accommodations and then supporting that process by posting a reasonable accommodation statement in key areas like hiring websites, in job descriptions, and in invitations to events like interviews, onboarding, and trainings. Another idea is to offer a variety of types of education to all employees. Certainly, it's important to train new employees on the reasonable accommodation process, but also to train all employees and supervisors on a regular basis. Education can also mean including topics related to disability in employee newsletters that include dispelling the stereotypes and myths that can exist. When we think about neurodiversity in the workplace, this impacts everyone because as we said in the beginning of the webinar, each of our brains is unique in the way it functions and processes information. This can be beneficial in the workplace because people will bring their unique approach to solving problems and share their own creative ideas, which can inspire innovative products and services for employers. Ways to foster a neurodiverse culture can include asking all employees what tools and support they need to do their jobs effectively, considering everyone's needs when creating office and workspace arrangements, offering a variety of types of social activities to build camaraderie and teamwork so employees can choose the social setting that works best for them, and remembering to give advance notice when you can of any changes planned at work along with the reason for the change. Julie, employees who view their employers as disability inclusive are often more comfortable disclosing their disabilities, which is a requirement if they request reasonable accommodations. Many neurodivergent conditions are invisible. Therefore, individuals with these conditions frequently have the choice to disclose a disability. What are some reasons people with disabilities might choose not to disclose? Justin, people with disabilities may feel reluctant to disclose an invisible disability, and even when the disability is apparent, they may feel hesitant to request an accommodation. And this can be because of a fear that disclosing and asking for an accommodation will negatively impact whether they are hired for a job or selected for a promotion, or a fear that doing so will make others judge them and they won't feel like they fit in. However, some people who are neurodivergent have reported 
disclosing and asking for an accommodation made them feel more comfortable being themselves at work, and it relieved the energy it took to keep that information private, freeing them up to focus that energy on applying their talent and skills on the job. So for many reasons, it's beneficial for employers to foster disability inclusive cultures. Julie, we mentioned that everyone is unique. Therefore, sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes generalizations or myths are made about people with disabilities. Sometimes these generalizations might affect individuals negatively in the hiring process and at work. Why don't we work through some of these myths? I'll provide the myth and then you offer the fact. Sounds good, Dustin. Okay, the first myth is that neurodiversity only includes autism. Dustin, the term neurodiversity was first created by an Australian sociologist who has autism. The neurodiversity movement has expanded over time to include conditions like epilepsy, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay, Julie, what about a belief that individuals who are neurodivergent are best suited for jobs that include repetitive tasks? Justin, there isn't a specific job or tasks that are best suited for individuals who are neurodivergent. What makes each of us neurodiverse is the fact that our brains function uniquely and are not the same. So while some individuals may enjoy performing repetitive tasks and excel at this, Others may enjoy being innovative and having jobs that are more creative. There is a resource from EARN that shared some employers have experienced neurodivergent employees successfully applying their skills to jobs that require attention to detail, reasoning, and that have complex processes, which has led these employers to recruit neurodivergent candidates for positions in cybersecurity, data analysis, and software engineering and testing. The resource also shares that some individuals who are neurodivergent excel in jobs that include focusing on communications, social media use, and the design and manufacturing of new products. So overall, it's best to not assume a certain job or tasks are best suited for someone based on a disability type. Julie, how about the idea that individuals who are neurodivergent prefer not to form relationships? Some people who are neurodivergent have limitations with social interactions and with understanding social cues. This does not mean they prefer not to perform relationships, not to form relationships. In fact, genuine and fulfilling relationships are possible when both parties accept one another and their differences. Julie, that sounds like a good recipe for all relationships. Just as a reminder, in Andrew's story, he mentions how much he likes his coworkers. So then what about the belief that individuals who are neurodivergent lack communication skills? Dustin, communication skills can be impacted, and when that's the case, individuals may have a preferred way of communicating. For example, a person may need time to process what they've heard and formulate a response. Another person may prefer to communicate through writing. It's helpful to consider the needs and preferences of the individual. And in the workplace, remember that accommodations are available. Julie, what about the idea that individuals who are neurodivergent have intellectual disabilities? Justin, we said at the beginning of the webinar that many conditions fall under the category of neurodivergence. One of those conditions is intellectual disabilities. So some people who are neurodivergent may have an intellectual disability while others do not. In general, the limitations an individual who is neurodivergent may experience are often not related to intelligence. They involve perception, thought processes, and social interactions. Many individuals who are neurodivergent have an intelligence quotient or IQ in the typical range or higher. Okay, Julie, last one. How about the sense that individuals who are neurodivergent should be encouraged to be like their neurotypical peers? Dustin, we have said a few times already that neurodiversity means no two people's brains are the same. And there is benefit to that in the way we approach solving problems and bring creativity and innovation to work tasks. The focus should be on accepting the individual and, when needed, collaborating with the individual to provide accommodations that enable him or her to perform the job using their unique talent and skills. Thank you, Julie. Let's review some general guidelines for interacting with colleagues with disabilities. Sure, Dustin, we have four disability etiquette tips to share. The first is to show respect. People with disabilities are people first. 
So focus on the person and not the disability. Next, be courteous. This includes respecting a person's personal space and any reasonable accommodations they may use at work. Another tip is don't assume. All people are unique with limitations and abilities. Don't assume you know what a person can or cannot do. Instead, let the person decide what they can do. And a final tip, ask first. If you think someone needs assistance, don't automatically provide the help you think they need. Ask the person if they need help, and if they do, ask how you can help. Julie, what advice do you have specific to interacting with people who are neurodivergent? Dustin, when you are communicating with a neurodivergent individual, always presume competence. It's respectful to talk to the person, not to someone else about the person. Just because the individual may have limitations with communicating doesn't mean they don't understand what you are saying. When you are talking, be direct with your questions and use plain language, which is clear and concise and free of jargon or slang terms. Be patient and give the person time to respond. At times, it may be helpful to write information down or use images when communicating. Also, if the person responds to you with a blunt or frank comment, don't take it personally. And remember to look past repetitive behaviors the person may display, just as you would ignore a person twirling their hair between their fingers, and focus on the unique person you are interacting with. Now, Julie, the audience might have noticed during today's webinar that we have been switching between saying individual who is neurodivergent and neurodivergent individual. This has been intentional. Do you want to explain? Yes, Dustin, thank you. Some individuals with disabilities prefer people first language, while others prefer identity first language. People first language puts the person first and the disability second, like when we say individual who is neurodivergent. Identity first language puts the disability first, like when we say neurodivergent individual. So the best practice is to ask the individual how they prefer to be addressed. When in doubt, the recommendation is to use people first language. Because we are aware of these preferences in our general communications about disability and neurodivergence, we alternate between people first and identity first language. Great, so now we are going to break for questions and just so that everyone knows, we did receive some questions that were submitted with the registration for this webinar. So we're going to weave those questions in with the questions from the Q&A box. And Julie, one of the first questions that was submitted with registration, um, can you provide any tips on how employers can quell fears of retaliation to encourage people to self-identify so they can have conversations about what accommodations they may need? Yes, thank you, Dustin. So this question is really getting at how employers can go about creating workplace cultures that are inclusive of people with disabilities. And so um, we have an entire handbook called the Inclusive Employer Handbook that's filled with ideas for employers. And that's not to imply that it takes an entire handbook to do that, but there's just a lot of ways to go about it. Many employers um, are probably doing many of these things already. So um, just some quick ideas is to engage your top leadership in your efforts to create a disability inclusive workplace. They can engage by placing statements on your hiring pages or on the website that you're a disability inclusive workplace. Um, they can also be present in any um, employee resource group that you might put together that's focused on disability in the workplace. Um, having them involved helps with making decisions and also funding any efforts or projects that might come out of those groups. Um, some great ways to influence your culture is to establish a reasonable accommodation process and then tell your employees that you have one. So train all your new employees as they're coming in through onboarding, but also remember it's important to repeat that training for all employees and for your supervisors because they have a role in the reasonable accommodation process as well. Beyond that, um, many employers have intranets and employee newsletters. So in these locations, include topics related to disability, um, provide education that dispels any myths or stereotypes related to disability. Um, and certainly any employer partner who has an interest in talking about this in more depth and customizing some of these strategies for your workplace could reach out to us for a um, accessibility and inclusion consult. Great, thank you, Julie. Another question that we have, do you know of any free or low cost resources an employee could use to obtain a diagnosis if they feel they are a neurodiverse individual? 
Yes, that's a good question because sometimes this um, diagnosis or um, awareness is is comes out of the educational system as a person is coming up through school and college, but sometimes it's not. And so what I recommend, most employers have an, an um, employee assistance program known as an EAP, and usually a part of those initial calls with that type of program would include some kind of an assessment or resources to help a person um, through that process of maybe figuring out a diagnosis. Great, thank you. Looks like that's all the questions we have for now. Thank you for everyone who <laughs> submitted questions. As a reminder, we're going to stop again before we finish today's presentation for questions. So please feel free to post any more questions that you have in the Q&A box as we go along. OK, Julie, let's review another story. This one is about Viviana and was published in the OOD Works newsletter on October 16th, 2020. Viviana has autism. She always loved pets and working in the kitchen and hoped to make a career out of one of those interests. She volunteered at a food pantry after high school. However, she had difficulty articulating this experience and her strengths during job interviews. Dustin, Viviana worked with a job developer to get an interview with Erie Bonebrook in Cleveland for a position making dog treats. During the interview, she demonstrated some of the job's essential functions. Julie, Viviana was offered the job and she said that work is very important because it teaches me to be a responsible young adult. Viviana's story is a good one as we start to discuss reasonable accommodations in the interactive process. We mentioned that she utilized a job developer, which is one example of a reasonable accommodation. A job developer might help a candidate who is neurodivergent feel confident that they understand interview questions. Julie, can you give us a quick review of what reasonable accommodations are and what the interactive process is? Sure. A reasonable accommodation is a change in the way something is customarily done at work to enable an individual with a disability to compete for a job, perform a job, and enjoy the privileges of employment. Not every person with a disability needs an accommodation. However, when an accommodation is requested, the employer should begin the interactive process quickly. And this is the collaborative process described by the ADA, where both parties work together to identify and implement an effective solution. Julie, what constitutes a request for a reasonable accommodation? Justin, the ADA intended for it to be easy to make a request, and so a person just needs to communicate they need a change at work related to a medical condition or a disability. That's enough for an employer to be on notice that they've received a request for an accommodation. The person can use plain language, so the request does not have to reference the ADA or use the term reasonable accommodation. Julie, I thought it would be good to highlight that requests may be made in the individual's preferred form of communication. We mentioned earlier that individuals who are neurodivergent may have limitations in their communication skills. Therefore, a reasonable accommodation process that specifies a certain way to communicate accommodation requests might exclude some people. That's right, Dustin. And a person's preferred form may include an in-person conversation, an email, or a phone call. Julie, an individual who is neurodivergent may have difficulty communicating a request in general. Right, so the ADA indicates a request can come from another party, like a family member or a medical provider. And it's helpful to remember a request can be made at any point during the hiring process or employment. A person may not need an accommodation until a barrier presents itself. And so a person isn't required to know they need an accommodation and ask for it at any certain time. Julie, let's go to the interactive process. Neurodivergent conditions are not always obvious in the way other conditions can be, like when a person has a physical disability and uses a wheelchair. Can employers request documentation of a disability when an individual who is neurodivergent requests an accommodation? Justin, when an employer receives a request for an accommodation and begins the interactive process, one of the initial steps they take is to decide whether they need documentation. The ADA says employers are permitted to verify a person has a disability. If the disability is obvious, employers don't need documentation to verify this and are not permitted to ask for it. However, when the disability is not obvious, which can be the case with neurodivergence, the employer can ask for documentation to verify the disability. The next step employers usually take is to determine the need for the accommodation. 
The same rule applies here. If the need for the accommodation is obvious, the employer does not need documentation and is not permitted to ask for it. If the need for the accommodation is not obvious, the employer can ask for documentation <coughs> to verify the need. In the case of neurodivergence, the disability and the need for the accommodation are often invisible, and the employer is then permitted to request documentation if they wish. Julie, this seems like a good time to discuss how the ADA defines disability because it does differ from other entities and laws. That's right, Dustin. The ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. A major life activity is a daily function that is important to most people and that most people in the general population can perform with little or no difficulty. So these are functions like learning, reading, thinking, concentrating, interacting with others, speaking, and performing manual tasks. Major life activities also include major bodily functions, like the functions of the brain, neurological, digestive, and endocrine systems. How an individual's neurodivergence impacts major life activities and major bodily functions will be unique to each person. Now, the ADA does not have a list of conditions that automatically qualify a person as having a disability, but they do provide a non-exhaustive list of conditions that should easily be concluded to be a disability. And some examples related to neurodivergence include intellectual disability, epilepsy, autism, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and schizophrenia. So Dustin, this could be helpful for employers when they are determining whether they are permitted to obtain documentation. Now, Julie, the next step in the interactive process is to identify an effective reasonable accommodation. Where should the employer start? Dustin, the best place to start is to ask the employee what they think. They may have experienced the barrier before and know what will work best. At times, it can be helpful to consult the employee's supervisor about the job's essential functions and whether there are any performance concerns, because this may help uncover a barrier and lead to an effective idea for an accommodation. Certainly, it's helpful to know the limitation the employee is experiencing in the workplace related to the disability. Julie, let's review the limitations that may be impacted in the workplace. Sure, Dustin. Individuals who are neurodivergent may experience difficulty with social communication and interaction, challenges with speech and language, challenges with learning related to difficulties with focus, reading, calculation, following spoken language, memory, being flexible in thinking and self-control, sensitivity or insensitivity to sensory input, things like light, sound, heat, cold, pressure, and crowds, difficulty with motor coordination, physical behavior such as rocking, expression of tics, blurting and unexpected shouting, and difficulty adapting to changes and transitions. As we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, all employees are unique. And so while a person may experience some of these limitations, it would be rare to experience all of them. That's one reason why a reasonable accommodation should always be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Julie, it's also helpful to know the many types of accommodations that are available as the employer is collaborating with the employee to identify a solution. Yes, accommodations are organized into these types, making the work environment accessible, restructuring a job, permitting a flexible schedule, providing or altering equipment and services, altering supervisory methods, modifying policies, and providing reassignment. Great. Julie, what are some ways that an employer might make a workplace more accessible for a person who is neurodivergent? Dustin, a person who is neurodivergent may experience sensitivities in the workplace to things like sounds, lights, fragrances, or temperature. Some ways to include making the workplace accessible is to relocate a workstation to a quieter area, replace overhead lighting with LED lighting, or provide alternative lighting options, permit the temperature to be adjusted, and institute a fragrance-free environment. Julie, how might an employer restructure a job? 
Just in restructuring the job means the employer is looking for a solution to perform the job's essential functions in another way, or is considering whether the job's marginal functions can be removed or traded with a coworker. One idea I have relates to what we just talked about, sensitivities to elements in the workplace. A, so a solution for this can be to permit the employee to telework. Other ideas related to restructuring how the job is performed include breaking down large projects into smaller steps, providing instructions in the person's preferred format, which could be written, audio, images, or in an email, and compiling written information in a more organized way by using section headers and bullet points in documents. Julie, what are some ways an employer can permit a flexible schedule? One idea to minimize exposure to noise in the workplace may be to permit an employee to work during those hours when there are fewer people working. And another tip is to provide a modified break schedule so an employee can take more breaks during the day or when they are needed to have a movement break or to call a family member or a friend for support during the workday. Julie, we mentioned that Viviana utilized a job developer. This can be an accommodation for the hiring and interviewing process. Similarly, a job coach might help a person with a disability to onboard to a new job. These are examples of services that can be provided as an accommodation. Can you name some other equipment or services? Justin, there are quite a few items and types of assistive technology that can be useful depending on what the job task is and what limitation or barrier is present. There is software, and apps that support literacy through things like word prediction, checking for spelling errors, and offering corrections for grammar. There are items like digital recorders, digital timers, and reminder apps to support memory. To support viewing text on computer monitors, there are solutions like screen filters, tinting tools, and controls for font size, font style, and color contrast. To filter out noise in the background, noise canceling headphones or earbuds can be a good option. And I do have an example of a piece of equipment from the Job Accommodation Network, um, which is known as JAN. And this is about a building contractor with dyscalculia who was experiencing difficulties with creating job quotes, and he was taking additional time to check his work. As a reasonable accommodation, the employer provided the contractor with a contractor's calculator which enabled the contractor to be more efficient and accurate. Julie, another type of accommodation is altering supervisory methods. Can you go into more detail? Dustin, a common question we receive is whether an employer is required to change a person's supervisor as a form of reasonable accommodation. And the answer is no. However, altering a supervisory method is a form of reasonable accommodation. This may mean an employer increases the frequency of how often they meet with the employee to provide feedback on work tasks. Another modification could be to provide instructions using plain language that is clear and concise and free of undefined technical terms or jargon. One final idea is to provide the employee with advance notice of events or changes at work, like upcoming training sessions or schedule changes. Julie, in what ways can employers modify policies? Justin, one example is to modify a dress code policy to permit an employee with a tactile sensitivity to wear an alternative uniform at work. Or it could be to modify a training policy to permit providing training materials in advance and to permit the use of a job coach during onboarding. Now, Julie, a lot of these examples are for individuals who have obtained a job and need support to complete it. However, sometimes an individual might experience a barrier in the hiring process. As we mentioned with Viviana, she had difficulty explaining her experience in an interview setting and was permitted to provide a demonstration of the job tasks. What are some accommodations that might be helpful in the hiring process for individuals who are neurodivergent? Justin, I have two examples to share. The first is an applicant with autism who has a limitation with verbal communication, but can communicate effectively through email and handwriting. He was invited to interview for a research position he applied for at a chemical company. The invitation stated the interview would be a panel style with three interviewers. As a reasonable accommodation, he requests to receive the questions in advance 
and be permitted to provide a written response during the interview. In the second example, an applicant with a sensory processing disorder has been invited for an interview. The applicant knows she is distracted by noisy and busy environments. Because the invitation did not describe the interview environment, the applicant requests a reasonable accommodation that includes visiting the office in advance to feel more comfortable with the setting and to prepare for the interview. This visit will also help the applicant to know whether she needs additional accommodations, such as a virtual or remote interview, to minimize distractions. Thanks, Julie. As we mentioned previously, neurodivergent conditions are not always obvious. Therefore, employees with these disabilities may not want to share information about their conditions with other employees. What should employers remember about confidentiality? Dustin, the guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the EEOC, indicates the information employers receive related to a disclosure of disability, a request for an accommodation, and from facilitating the interactive process should be kept in separate medical files that are stored apart from general personnel files, whether they are stored electronically or in physical filing cabinets. The guidance also indicates when certain information may be shared with designated parties. For example, employees who work in IT or facilities are permitted to know what is necessary to facilitate accommodations effectively. And supervisors often need to know about an accommodation so they can help facilitate it or be aware of it, like when a supervisory method is being altered. However, these parties are not permitted to know details about the disability type or the related limitations. Julie, we know it's common for supervisors to receive questions from other coworkers about the accommodations they notice in the workplace. How should they handle this? Dustin, a best practice is to prepare a response ahead of time. We know the employer cannot respond by saying the individual has a disability. The employer also cannot mention the individual is receiving a reasonable accommodation. This term is unique to the ADA and using it would automatically disclose a person has a disability. What the EEOC suggests for consideration is responding with a statement that emphasizes the employer's policy to assist any employee who encounters difficulty at work and to then explain these types of situations are personal and the employer is required to follow confidentiality guidelines. The guidance also suggests the employer reassure the coworker that their privacy would be respected similarly. So it is a best practice to prepare supervisors and the employees who implement reasonable accommodations with a response for these questions so they can respond appropriately. One way to prevent questions is to train all employees on the right to reasonable accommodation for individuals with disabilities. Okay, Julie, let's move on to our next story. This one is about Jarrett and was published in the OOD Works newsletter on February 25th, 2022 as a video. Jarrett has autism. In the video, he shares that he attended the Career, Technology, Career and Technology Education Center of Licking County during his final two years of high school. There, he studied collision repair techniques. After graduating, he quickly found a job with Carvana in Licking County. Dustin, Jarrett was hired to do car detailing. However, he quickly moved into the paint department. As a result of his income, he was able to upgrade his personal car. Julie Jarrett shared that several of his friends and his dad also got jobs at Carvana, so he must enjoy working there. It sounds like Jarrett might have transitioned to a preferred position. Therefore, his performance at work must have been pretty good. Can you tell us what is important to remember about performance when it comes to the interactive process and accommodations? Sure, Dustin, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, the ADA does require individuals with disabilities to be qualified to perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation in order to receive protection under the law. So employers can expect all employees, including employees with disabilities, to meet their performance standards. When it comes to measuring performance, employers generally assess all employees the same way to determine whether they are meeting these expectations. The most common question we receive is about what to do when an employee discloses a disability during a low performance discussion. This question generally arises when the employee has an invisible disability and the need for the accommodation is not obvious to the employer. 
The employer may feel caught off guard and unsure of how to handle the situation. Based on that, it could be helpful to train the supervisors or HR staff who are having these discussions on how to proceed when a disability is disclosed. Now, low performance may be the first indicator to an employee that their disability is contributing to their work, which means it can be a natural time that an employee would choose to disclose and may or may not request an accommodation. When the employee does ask for an accommodation, the employer should begin the interactive process quickly, just as they would any request they receive for an accommodation. If the employee discloses a disability but doesn't ask for an accommodation, the employer can ask additional questions to determine if beginning the interactive process is appropriate. Employers have also asked whether they are permitted to apply the consequences of low performance when disability is disclosed. And the answer is generally yes, as long as the consequences are applied to any employee with low performance in the same job class. But remember to also begin the interactive process to consider a reasonable accommodation as well. Thank you. What might be unique about conduct standards or practices when it comes to people who are neurodivergent? Dustin employers can generally expect all employees, including employees with disabilities, to meet their conduct standards. If an employee with a disability violates a conduct rule and disability is not a contributing factor, the employer can apply the same consequences it would apply to any employee who broke the same rule. Now, when an employer responds to discipline for misconduct by disclosing a disability and request a reasonable accommodation, the employer should begin the interactive process, just like we mentioned with performance. And the employer may apply the consequences for the misconduct, as long as the conduct rule is job related and consistent with business necessity and equally applied to all employees. Julie, what would you like to share about safety standards? Now, since employers are permitted to create a qualification standard that requires all employees not pose a direct threat in the workplace. A direct threat is a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by reasonable accommodation. What's important to know is if an employer thinks a direct threat may exist, they cannot make this determination based on fears, myths, stereotypes, or generalizations. They must use the EEOC criteria to assess the situation. And this includes assessing the individual's knowledge, skills, experience, and ability to safely do the job. It includes identifying the specific risk and showing the risk is current and not speculative or remote. It includes performing an assessment based on objective evidence and determining if the risk can be eliminated or reduced through a reasonable accommodation. Julie, we know the natural variation in the human brain can positively impact the workplace through improved creativity, innovative thinking, and problem solving. The barrier to these benefits can be a work environment designed for individuals who are neurotypical and not inclusive of individuals who are neurodivergent. Many employers are beginning to realize these benefits and are working to remove these barriers. So the workplace is neurodiverse friendly for all employees. Can you briefly review some resources you have for employers to support these efforts? Sure, Dustin. First, Disability In offers employers a resource on their website called Framework for Neurodiversity at Work Pilots. And this includes four steps that address internal planning, scope and employment modeling, internal training, and recruiting and sourcing talent for a more neurodiverse workforce. EARN offers a guide on their website called Neurodiversity in the Workplace, which defines neurodiversity and neurodivergence, describes the benefits of neurodiversity in the workplace, and shares ideas for accommodating and supporting neurodivergent employees. One last resource I'll share is from the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence, which is known as OCALI. OCALI has several resources, but the one I want to highlight is the Employer Toolkit on its website. It's called the Employee with Autism Spectrum Disorder. This toolkit provides employers with a greater awareness of autism, shares strategies and accommodation ideas to support employees with autism, and includes education for employees and supervisors who interact with colleagues with autism. So these resources and several others are included in the, in the Learner's Guide for this webinar. Great, Julie. I think we are ready to answer some more questions. So the first question that's in the Q&A box, 
um, is if an organization is leaning more fully into hiring neurodivergent individuals, are there some initial critical steps that they should take? You know, just like reasonable accommodations are unique, so are the steps that employers take with the initiatives that they, they want to implement in the workplace or how they want to influence their culture. Um, I think the best place to start for that is with just some of the resources that we just mentioned so that you can see the different ways that other companies have implemented these initiatives and align those with the ones that make sense for your work environment to move forward with first. Um, and that's a great question as an example of how I can work with employers on a consult to really customize some of these steps that you may take and help support you in your goals. Great, thank you, Julie. Um, what resources are there for those who lead meetings so they can facilitate conversations that are inclusive of neurodiverse staff members who are not always heard or understood by others? So there are resources for how to create um, accessible meetings. Um, some of the practices that we've talked about here can be helpful for those that lead meetings. So remember to, um, to use plain language. If you're using any technical terms or jargon, make sure to define those. Um, include options for more than one way to, to share the information. So it could be in a written form. It could be through um, email. It could be through audio and, and invite everybody to participate in the meeting in the way that they they prefer to communicate. Um, <clears throat> another idea for that is when you send out the invitation for the meeting, describe the meeting um, the best way that you can and include your reasonable accommodation statement in that invitation so that somebody feels comfortable to ask for what they need to be able to fully participate in that meeting effectively. Um, that's a great way to find out how to make it inclusive and accessible. All right, are there recommended strategies for new or existing teams who may have members that are neurodiverse and who may or may not be sharing that information with others on their team? Yeah, that's a great question because it touches on a few things we talked about today where sometimes with an invisible disability, a person has not disclosed their disability or requested an accommodation. And there are ways to make the environment more neurodiverse inclusive for everybody. And there's no everybody, no two people are the same, right? So neurodiverse, neurodiversity applies to all of us. So some of the things we mentioned is asking everybody what their opinion is or what their needs are for the workplace. And so as you're having meetings and 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 you're working together and collaborating, is allow everybody to to share how they work best. So if if um, again we've talked about how to alter communications and written materials, um, but that you know I, that that's one way that I would recommend approaching that. Awesome. Um, if this one's kind of long, so here we go. If someone has accommodations in place, but something that is non-routine comes up, for example, attending a meeting at an offsite location, should the employer proactively ask questions or make a plan with the employee about how they plan to attend safely? Or should it fall to the employee with an accommodation to ensure they are working within their agreed upon accommodation? That's a fantastic question. and. Absolutely. If you as the employer know the individual has a disability and you can reasonably believe that they need an accommodation, yes, you can ask. And that's the perfect example is when there's something that may not um, be customary in that person's workday. That could be you're going to go to a conference or you're going to give a presentation for the first time or there's something new. Um, the, the key things to remember here is that you have to know the person has the disability. You know that either because it's obvious or they've disclosed it to you previously, and you reasonably believe that they need a reasonable accommodation. Great, thank you. And one more question that was pre-submitted. What accommodations can students use in their employment experience that someone can teach or use while they are still in high school to master those skills? This is another great question, and the answer is really a lot of the accommodations that we talked about today that can be helpful in the workplace can also be helpful in the school environment because these two environments can be similar. Obviously, they can be different, but they can be very similar with the um, the barriers that that are present. And so, um, for example, we talked about how if the work environment is noisy and distracting from that perspective that you might relocate a person's workstation to a quieter area. Um, there was a period of time in my occupational therapy career that I worked in the school setting, and I remember a student that had an auditory processing disorder, and he could receive the information in the classroom most effectively if he was seated in a certain location. And so that concept of what helped 
that student to receive information in the classroom could be effective when he graduates and goes on to have a job somewhere. Um, so a lot of these cross over. I think what's important, and Dustin, you, you pointed this out when we talked about this question when we received it, um, something to add to this is to educate the student that these accommodations you may be using in the school system could be helpful when you do have a career you do have a right to reasonable accommodation. There is a process and educate the individual on how to advocate, advocate for themselves so that what they need along the way as they transition from school to, to the workplace, they can ask for and receive. Great, thank you, Julie, and thank you all. Those were all really great questions today, so thank you for submitting those. We have one more story we'd like to share. This one is about Brandon and was published in the OOD Works newsletter on July 29th, 2022. Brandon is on the autism spectrum. He attends Columbus State Community College and is pursuing an Associate of Arts degree in business. In the summer of 2021, Brandon was hired for an internship with J.P. Morgan Chase in the community, Consumer and Community Banking Department. Due to his success in that internship, Brandon was invited to work with J.P. Morgan Chase the following summer to find efficiencies and ensure programs comply with audits. Brandon's supervisor at Chase stated Brandon has been a pleasure to work with. He is extremely motivated to learn new technologies and has been enjoying learning new reporting tools this summer. Brandon said, work is important to me. I feel a calling to work so that I can help others in the community understand financial matters. So before we conclude today, Julie, what final thoughts would you like to share? Thank you, Dustin. We have emphasized throughout the webinar how neurodiversity means there is variance in how all of our brains function. Many environments have been created for individuals who fall within the norms of that variation, and that can result in barriers for individuals who are neurodivergent. We offered many ideas today to remove these barriers through providing reasonable accommodations, like minimizing exposure to sensory sensitivities in the workplace by relocating workstations, permitting telework, and providing alternative lighting. We also shared ideas for altering supervisory methods to meet more frequently or provide communications in various formats like audio, email, or in writing. These solutions can enable individuals who are neurodivergent to perform the essential functions of the job in another way just as effectively. When we make these changes and create environments that are inclusive of neurodiversity, we tap into increased creativity, problem solving, and innovation, which are great benefits in the workplace. As always, our team is here to support our employer partners with their efforts to create accessible environments and inclusive cultures. So please contact us if we can help in any way.